Well, we are right at seven o'clock. I know more people will be trickling in, but I know that you <laughs> have a wonderful presentation and we don't want you to feel rushed at all. So um, I'm going to get everything started here. Um, so I want to welcome everyone to our fall edibles and their toxic lookalikes. Um, our presenter is Bill Pakaitis this evening. Um, and yeah, I just I want to thank you for joining us. This is our continuing series on fungi. Um, and uh, my name is Lauren Bohr, um, the Education Coordinator for Youth and Public Programs here at Mohonk Preserve. And I'm the one who's going to be monitoring this um, presentation. I'll be monitoring the chat. Um, so if you have any questions, like I said, please feel free to use the chat box to ask any questions. We will have time at the end um, for any questions. Um, you'll notice that um, there's a little hand to speak. Um, if you would prefer to ask a question verbally rather than typing it in, maybe typing is not your thing, um, please do use the speak. Um, and that's during the end of our program when we have our um, question and answer time. Um, but otherwise, uh, please do feel free to use our chat and we'll get to all those questions. We are recording this presentation. So um, if you have to uh, bug out for any reason partway through, have no fear. Uh, we will uh, record this and this will be up on our website under virtual recording. So we also have uh, Bill's past presentations on um, fungus. So if there's any topics that you are interested in and you want to know more about, we have presentations on chanterelles and morels, um, winter fungi. We, we've got the whole ecology of fungus. The whole gamut is there um, that Bill has been uh, wonderful to provide us with these presentations. So those are all recorded. Feel free to explore those at your leisure. Um, so now we are going to introduce Bill and we'll get this started. So Bill Bakaitis taught at the Dutchess County Community College for almost 40 years prior to retirement. And during your his teaching career, he was granted sabbaticals to study mycology at SUNY New Paltz and at the New York State Museum in Albany, where he worked with John Haynes, um, the New York State mycologist. So that name might ring a few bells for you. He's a very popular speaker, and not only does he do presentations for us here at Mohonk Preserve, but he's also given educational programs in mycology at the Institute of Ecosystem Studies, which is in Millbrook, New York, and the Culinary Institute of America in Hyde Park. Hudsonia at Bard College, as well as many other institutions throughout the Northeast. So in 1983, he founded the Mid-Hudson Mycological Association, and since 1984 has worked with poison control networks throughout the Northeast. So this uh, this presentation here, he has a lot of knowledge on those toxic lookalikes, what you can and cannot eat. Um, his articles have been published in the New York State Conservationist, Adirondack Life, the Mid-Hudson Magazine, the Poughkeepsie Journal, um, Mushroom, the Journal of Wild Mushrooming, where he's a, still a continuing ed editor, and other places throughout uh, the mycology world. So without further ado, I'd like to turn things over to Bill um, presenting uh, this evening's topic, which is our fall edibles and their toxic lookalikes. So take it away, Bill. Oh, thanks. Thank you very much. One correction there. I'm no longer contributing editor at, uh, at Mushroom the Journal. I think they've moved on to uh, a younger group there. Uh, they, I think they also they've been rather eclipsed by, by the, the, the magazine Fungi, Britt Bunyard's magazine. At any rate, uh, we are here and we're going to talk about uh, mushrooms. Uh, what I'm going to do is concentrate on some of the ones around the Mid-Hudson area, uh, some of the ones. I mean, there are three to 5,000 species uh, of fungi out there, of, of macro fungi. Uh, so there's, there's no way that uh, anyone can know all of them. Um, most, most of what happens is that people specialize in a, in a genera, in a, in a genera. Um, I, I, I worked a lot with Amanita um, because I worked with Boys in Control, and, and we'll talk a bit about some of this. Um, maybe before we get started, I, I don't know, uh, Lauren said, uh, hold your questions to the end. But I'm wondering, Lauren, if anyone has any questions on that handout before we start, um, maybe we could uh, 
handle that question? If anyone sure. Else? Yeah. Yeah. I would like to mention to everyone. Um, I did email everyone this afternoon with some files that um, Bill has shared some documents um, and they're also here um, in our presentation. So you'll probably see that there is a little paperclip symbol um, with a little red dot. Perhaps there are um, files that you can download right now. You can open them, download them and take a look at them. Um, it's it's a lot of information that are in those handouts. But if anyone has a question right off the bat, feel free to um, to type it in or raise your hand to speak. Mm -hmm. uh, I know the first paragraph of that handout, I, I talk in, in the print just very briefly about three ways of uh, identifying fungi. Uh, I think that's the third presentation in this series, the one on chanterelles, where I, I spend maybe 10 or 15 minutes elaborating on those concepts. I'll mention them today, but I won't, won't go into that in much detail. So, um, well, I see no one is, is shouting out things, so I assume we'll just go on, but, uh, you, but we'll pick up questions uh, at the end, as Lauren says. Okay. So when we're talking here about edible mushrooms, obviously people are going to go out and pick them and eat them. And uh, one of the things that, that has been noticed in the poison control world is that in the last two or three years, there's been a, a rather large increase in the number of people who eat mushrooms and get sick uh, and um, they're making mistakes while out foraging. And uh, it raises the question, why is that sudden increase going on right now? And I think we can talk about a number of things and, and they, may, they may be landing in your backyard here. One of them is mushrooming is mushrooming. There, there's just such a popular interest today in foraging uh, uh, for all sorts of, of, of plants and, uh, and animals. And uh, I guess foraging for animals means hunting, but, but plants and mushrooms for sure. And there's a lot of talk about medicinal mushrooms and psychedelics and fantastic mushrooms and the, the intelligence of a wood wide web and all of those all of those events together in the popular press have just churned a great deal of interest. Along with that is that uh, there's we now have this digital domain that just surrounds us. You know this, we, we are all connected in some way through the internet, uh, and anybody can put anything they want on the internet on on YouTube messages or on Facebooks or 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 posting blogs or, or whatever. There's just a number of ways you can that, that can be done. Uh, and it takes a, a rather critical eye to, uh, to be able to untangle those and find out and determine which ones are credible and which ones should be taken with a grain of salt and which ones should be just rejected outright. Sometimes you can you can make those determinations quite easily. But, but when people talk about studies, study here, and, and this proves that, uh, it's important to know something about the scientific method and science doesn't try to prove anything. Science is trying to sort out all the conflicting information and arrive at something about truth. So, so that's uh, just important to, to approach the internet with a critical eye. Uh, the third thing uh, might be that there's been uh, since COVID, a lot of the mushroom clubs throughout the United States have been uh, inactive um, for obvious reasons. So when when people don't go out to uh, to collect mushrooms with people who know what they're doing, you can make mistakes. And I think also folks are not working as much. Uh, they hadn't been during COVID and they sought to go out and collect mushrooms and other things just for interest. And then this year, add the drought to that. There's just, uh, you know, all summer uh, throughout the Northeast, just profound, deep drought. And uh, no mushrooms could could survive. The mycelium just doesn't survive in that. Which, uh, which is one of the reasons why, why we had sought to, uh, to not offer. We had planned to offer a, a walk with this talk, but uh, we, we thought it not ethical to uh, advertise that and to bring people out when uh, there was a possibility of, of no fungi being there whatsoever. Um, we're going to have another talk in uh, 1st of November, and I believe we're, we're, conditions are okay, so we'll have a, uh, a walk with that. Maybe the fourth factor here is the uh, proliferation of new names in fungi. Uh, there are, uh, we can identify mushrooms by naked observation of our eyes and our nose and our tongue, uh, sort of sensory information. Then there's a field identifications. 
And that's where most of the old, the, the traditional names and traditional mycology came from. Those, those sensory observations uh, accentuated, uh, magnified by, by uh, other instruments and chemicals. Then there are mating studies where you can see which fungi mate with, with other fungi. And then lately we've gotten to DNA and cladistics. And those names do not necessarily agree. And matter of fact, most of the times, particularly with cladistics, they are inventing new names uh, in, in a very rapid fashion. Uh, when um, there are prominent mycologists who used to be the top of their field in, in a particular genera. And uh, they, I've heard them say that the names are changing so quickly that they cannot keep track of even uh, the, the genera with, as, as, the, as the genus that they're studying gets split into three or four or five or eight or ten different genera. So what that leaves a lot of people with are common names, and common names are very blurry. There's so many chicken mushrooms out there that, and what does it mean? You know, it's a chicken mushroom, and uh, there are hens, and there are roosters, and, uh, you know, people use those names, but, uh, and they have anecdotal evidence and maybe local evidence, but maybe the chicken mushroom on this side of the mountain is not the one on the other side of the mountain, and uh, there you go. And then the last thing is that because of uh, medical privacy laws and the HIPAA laws, uh, when we in poison control uh, go out uh, and, and identify a mushroom, it used to be that NAMA, the North American Mycological Association, uh, was a central collecting agency and, and all the, the, the fungi which caused poisonings were reported there. And that's gone on. I've worked for them now for 40 years. So for 40 years, we've done that. Uh, but about 10 years ago, because of HIPAA regulations, no longer do we get called with the frequency that we used to be called. And, and when we do get called, we can't speak with the person who has eaten the mushroom to find out more about it. So what it's done is just to, just to cast a, um, a blanket on, on what we've done in collecting information from NAMA. So I know they're working on that now in the central organization to see if there's a way of working around that. Uh, but that's that's the state right now. So uh, I'll just toot my horn a little bit here and say I think you are lucky because I am still around and doing this. And I have been I was doing this now for 40 years. So I have a lot of, uh, of anecdotal evidence uh, experience that with people that, who were my clients uh, uh, who uh, or, or cases I consulted on. And I can I can spice the talk up with some of those kinds of things, and we'll do that as we go along. Okay. Well, I do have a quick question here, Bill. Sure. Um, can you explain a little bit about what you mean, but with um, cladistics? Yes, in cladistics, um, you what, what's what's done now is you take DNA from uh, the from anything, you know, if you've watched any of those crime stories on television, you know how that's done. So you, you take DNA uh, and uh, if it's not contaminated, you get a pure DNA, you, uh, you're able to bulk it up and then to break it apart and then to make a barcode of it. And then you look at the barcodes of the different mushrooms and see which ones uh, uh, join together in which ways. And the ones which we think are, are related from this point of view, we call a clade. And so that's called cladistics. Yeah, I hope that. Yeah, sorry, I, I rushed over that. Yeah, but that's it's just it's using DNA to to identify mushrooms, and there are just so many. You, you know, sometimes one thinks that every particular fungus you pick up, every specimen is going to have a different uh, DNA about it. But they're we're we're splitting them. In, in the old days, they used to be called splitters, and we're splitting them very much now. So it gets confusing, and that's why one of the reasons why people use common names. Well. Here are a group of people out and they're under a tree and they are collecting mushrooms. And how on earth will they know if those mushrooms are edible or not? Well, uh, they might uh, ask the question, are they good mushrooms or dangerous toadstools? You know, and here's a scientific test that will determine that. Uh, and uh, here it is. Well, what does that mean? What that means is that there's no good animal models. You know, you can't feed them to monkeys or to dogs or to cats or to rats and see which ones are good or not. Uh, edibility has got to be determined from what you and I eat. Right? So that's, uh, that's we, we rely upon the human experience. And there are lots of old wives tales, I think they're called, you know, 
the, about how you identify mushrooms as edible or not. For example, you know, they say that any, any mushroom that will make a, a dime tarnish is no good to eat. Uh, well, I don't know about that. Here's one though, that all puff balls are good to eat. Well, it <clears throat> turns out that some puff balls indeed are deadly. And we'll look at one of those. And the other thing is that this is uh, the button stage of a deadly Amanita. <clears throat> Looks like a puffball, but it's not. <coughs> and this would be a puffball on the left here. On the right would be the button stage of an Amanita. And if you're a casual observer, you might not notice the difference in those. One of the things that we do right off the bat is any small puffball like that, until you're really good at identifying them, you slice them uh, right in half from top to bottom. And if you find something like this, what you see is this is an Amanita mushroom right here growing inside of its universal veil. And this is the this is the, the death cup at the bottom. Okay, So all Amanita start from a structure like that. And that's one of the reasons you want to, to have small puffballs until you know what you're doing. You want to uh, do that. Here, for example, is a, an Amanita, which is edible for experts. It's called, it's got a half a dozen or more different names. Amanita caesarea, caesarea is one name. Uh, Hemibafa is another name. Jacksonia is another name. Uh, New Jersey number five is another name. There's just there's a, a, a lot of names of, of this mushroom. Uh, so we call that a complex. But here you see down here is the, the, in this one, we see it has a white universal veil and a white cup, and the mushroom is uh, orange red. So it's easy to see there, that, that structure. And as the mushroom just expands up, you see what remains of that universal veil stays behind as the cup. Okay. Here's another mushroom, Amanita rubescens, the blusher. Again, experts can eat this one. Uh, I don't eat any, any Amanita, but, but experts will eat this one, and some of them like it a lot, and they tell you uh, they like it. And again, you see the swelling at the bottom of the cup. Now, in this case, the, the, the cup is made of cells which are more friable. They break apart. So instead of having a cup, what we have here are warts on the cap, the surface of the mushroom. But those are parts of the universal veil that was down here. And then here's a mushroom. It's the Amanita muscaria, variety formosa. There are lots of different names of this. Kasuia is a common name that they're now using, or Amara muscaria. Uh, but uh, most field guides, uh, you know, been, we're going to call this Amanita muscaria, the fly agaric. So uh, this one uh, is a toxic lookalike to uh, some of the others. And it has some differing, uh, it does have the, the, the friable veil, so it breaks apart at the top. You can see that. Now, the other thing it has is at the bottom, it has these ragged uh, processes right down at the bottom down there. And you can see them, you can see a button stage here with them here and here, you know. Um, this is a very common mushroom throughout. And it is, um, it's a mushroom that will give you a, what's called a sludge reaction. It's a, it, it, you'll tear, you'll, uh, you'll, you'll, maybe I won't go into all those. It, it's just, it's just uh, something you don't want to eat. It, it, it will, it will make you sick and make you, uh, wish you hadn't eaten it. I, I do, I have met a few people who have eaten this twice and, and I know some people have said, boy, what a mistake. I'll never eat that one again. And I said, well, why'd you eat it twice? He said, well, I wanted to see if it was bad as it was the first time. As sometimes people, you know, one, one pill makes you larger, one pill makes you small. And this here will affect your sensorium, uh, um, not only the way you taste and smell, but the way you feel and see things. So, so this one, some people eat this mushroom to get high, you know, and, uh, there's a lot of literature about that, and you can, you, I'm sure those of you who look online have found a lot of this, and there are people who tout that, and they say eat it to get high, and I guess, you know, it's something that people do. This is another uh, Amanita, which has a large uh, bulb at the bottom, and this is the destroying angel here. This is Amanita verosa, or bisporigera, and it has this universal veil at the bottom, and it grows up, and all Amanitas will have free gills. The gills do not touch the stem, and they're white gills, and they'll have a white spore print. And they, they it's about some of them will have this annulus, or another ring at the top here. But this one, you should get to know this mushroom uh, very well because uh, 
this a cubic centimeter of this is a, is a lethal dose. Uh, it takes about a week to kill you, but uh, it will destroy the fine tubules in your kidneys. And then uh, the, the, you won't be able to excrete the toxins. They will circulate in your blood, and then they'll destroy your liver. And death, when it comes, is about five days, seven days out. Um, it's a mushroom that you eat, and you get sick. Uh, it tastes good, and you'll get, uh, you'll get sick the next day or 12 to 24 hours. You go to the hospital or, or just be by yourself, and it will go away. But when it returns... Uh, it's, it means your, your kidneys and, and liver are, are damaged. So you want to stay away from that. And there, there, so here we just, we've talk, just talked about what, four or five different Amanita. And there, most of those will be in field guides. There are probably 100, 200 Amanita in the Hudson Valley. Okay, so how, how long would destroying Angel, how long would that um, take you to, to kill you, I guess? Uh, five to seven days typically is the time between ingestion and death. Mm. All right. yeah. Good to know. Yeah. And, but that gives a long time to start to, to treat those. The, the symptoms. And generally, if you manage the patient's vital signs, they'll survive. Um, now, here's a mushroom which is safe to eat. It's called Lepiota nocina, or now it's Lupo agaricus nocinum. And there are a number of different name changes. This is a very common name that's used. Uh, Say for most people, uh, but it resembles Amanita verusa. And here's a story I'll tell you. I'm teaching uh, down in, in my classroom, and I get a call from Benedictine Hospital up in Kingston. And they say, we've got a woman, a 65-year-old woman uh, who is a nurse. Her, her husband is a, pharma, is a doctor here at the hospital. She is in the hospital with... Uh, thinks she's eaten a poison mushroom. So I leave my class and I go up to see what I can do. And uh, there, there, no doubt about it, this is what was there in a bag. It was, it was a, a plastic bread bag and there were a dozen species in there. Well, here's the story. The year before, she and a friend gathered this mushroom, this one, Lepiota. They ate it. They loved it. A year later, the year that I was called in on the case, the, woman's, the, the woman in Socrates calls and says, oh, the, the mushrooms we ate last year are up again. Come and pick them. So she went and picked them, and that's what she picked. Well, that's what she ate. So when I came there, you know, and she, she and when she got sick, she knew immediately what was going on. Now, uh, and, and said, I'm going to die, aren't I? And I said, well, I, I don't know anything about that. Uh, but uh, you did eat the wrong mushroom. She lived. Uh, she had uh, liver damage. She had kidney damage. She had heart damage. She uh, and she had the best of care. Uh, but uh, she was not the person coming out of that experience that she was going into it. And here's a woman who had eaten mushrooms, quote, all her life. Right? But that kind of simple mistake is made. So sometimes when people go out, you know, I would say, you know, unless you're really, really sure of this mushroom, don't eat it. You know. There are no bright lines in nature. There's no, there's no, no black and white. There are lots and lots of grays and lots of areas where this mushroom, you know, will look uh, a bit like this one or this or this mushroom uh, will will uh, or or maybe the other way of putting it is this mushroom here will look more like this mushroom and you casually pick it and put it in your basket and and then you suffer the consequences. So that's why just about everyone says you have to be 100% sure of the mushroom before you eat it. And then when you eat it, you know, you try a little bit, just a little bit, keep something in the refrigerator, make sure that if something happens, you'll have the mushroom that can be identified, uh, and then try it a day or two later to see if you've developed any uh, personal allergies to that mushroom. Here's another mushroom which is commonly collected. I bet a lot of you look at that and you can know exactly what it is, right? Or you know what I'm about to call it. This is a honey mushroom, okay? Uh, Armillaria melia is the original, the honey mushroom. It's edible if well cooked. If it's not well cooked, it will make you pretty sick, okay? And, and well cooked does not mean stirring like a stir fry. It means this mushroom has to be cooked in boiling water or tomato sauce or hot oil for 5, 10, 15 minutes. Some people will boil it in water, throw the water away, boil it in water, throw the water away, and then they cook the mushroom. Uh, 
So it, it's edible if well cooked. But here's something else too. The DNA work that we talked about just a few minutes ago, the cladistics, this, this is not one mushroom. There are 19 separate species of honeys in the Northeast. And some of them are more toxic than others. Uh, actually, one of them we don't even, we've never found the mushroom for. We just found the DNA of it. But in this typical one, you're going to have hairs on the cap. You're going to have this, this cottony uh, under part of the veil. You're going to have a white, uh, uh, the veil, uh, the gills are going to be collected. It's going to be rather clean above that. There may be red spots in here in the gills. Um, and they grow in what we call cespitose clusters just like a handful of mushrooms growing from one point, and that's the honey mushroom. So we call that a complex of a lot of mushrooms that look, look alike. So here's a nurse uh, at the Connecticut Mycological Association, Connecticut Westchester Mycological Association. She's picked a lot of uh, honey mushrooms, but you wouldn't want to do this because now there's no way to separate the dirt from, from the mushrooms. So you want to be careful about that. So here's the honey mushroom in the melia or the typical yellow form. It's just one of the, the dozen or so different forms that exist here. Uh, and you could pick that mushroom and if it was well cooked, it would be edible. But if you pick this mushroom thinking it was this one, doesn't matter how much you cook it, this is going to make you sick. This is... Uh, Clytosabia ludens, Umphalotus salarius, uh, uh, a lot of different names here, it's commonly called the jack-o'-lantern mushroom because it glows in the dark. And it grows, it has that honey-colored cap, uh, and it grows in these cespitose clusters. And if that's all you're looking at, you don't notice that it has a ring. You don't notice the, uh, that this is, tends to be growing more, well, that, yeah, that, that would be the, the giveaway here. Uh, in particularly in this young stage here, um, you know, you could eat these. They smell great. They really smell great. Uh, here, here is uh, some of them right here. I believe uh, this was one of the ones used in the pre in the promo of the course to a mushroom like this. So this is a. Uh, you can see it has that those pumpkin colors to it and those those gills that descend the stalk a lot like uh, chanterelles do. Okay. And there's a whole bunch. See how big they get. This is a. This is a. I think probably eight inches there across, maybe twelve inches across. But the caps get quite large here. So one case I, I was involved with. Uh, there was a dude ranch over in Ulster County where the people would come up from the city and they ride horses and, you know, live in the house house there and they and, and had a great time. And uh, a lot of people from the community, same community, came up and one of the guys was a mushroom collector and he went out and brought these back, and. Uh, they smelled great. They were cooked up. And about 30 people ate those mushrooms. And then there was a, a caravan of ambulances bringing 30 people to the local hospitals where they were treated with for gastrointestinal disturbances. Uh, you, it, it smells great. <laughs> it really does. Don't eat it. I, I can tell you a dozen other stories on that, but just that's one you need to be aware of. Don't eat. And there it is glowing in the dark. Isn't that something? You have to go in and set yourself camera up in a in a closet and then wait till your eyes adjust and proceed with the photograph. But there it is. Here's another mushroom which looks a bit like the, the honey mushroom. Uh, this is Gymnopolis spectabilis. Again, there's there's a half dozen different names for this mushroom. This is a common one, it's the one that's used in, in Linkoff book. Uh, and it looks like honeys, uh, but it contains neurotoxins. Now this mushroom here will ha not have white spore print but it will have a brown spore print. And you can see here where the ring, where the brown spores are coloring the ring and, and down here. Okay. Here it is growing in a cespitose cluster. Uh, and there are enough mushrooms in that pack right there to get everybody in Ulster County high as a kite and laughing about the, their mistake. This is sometimes called the laughing gym, the big laughing gym. And they, it's, uh, it's you probably wouldn't think about that as a hallucinogenic mushroom, but there it is right there. Here's another, uh, I could tell you stories about that too. I mean, not, it's not everybody who eats this are going to have a good trip. I mean, there, there was, uh, I was called in on an attempted murder case on this, this, this very mushroom. Um, just so you can, well, you know, people do what they do. What? 
This is a, a very popular edible. This is called Flamulina volutipes, uh, velvet shank or velvet footed colibia. Um, this one is all sullied on the top because it's growing right in the bark of this uh, elm tree and there's some of that detritus there. But you see here, it's got white gills, right, that are attached to the stem there. And the, the um, stem turns this velvet color. So it's the velvet footed colibia. Uh, I like Flamulina, Voluta, Flamulina volutipes. It's sort of makes me think of a Spanish dancer. And here is what that mushroom looks like when it's cultivated on straw. And any of you who've done a lot of gourmet cooking probably have encountered this mushroom. It's called inataki. Okay, and uh, it looks like like spaghetti, right? It, it doesn't, doesn't, does not at all have the color or the taste of this one. It's rather, uh, and there's, there's another sort of lesson here. The same species, you could take spores of this mushroom, and if you grew it on straw, you'd get this. If you grew it on corn stalks, you'd get something a little different. So depending upon the substrate, you're going to have a different look to what the fungi look like. Uh, those of you who have not seen the first program of the series may want to go and take a look at that and see how it is that fungi feed. They, they really release enzymes and feed outside their body. Uh, it's just a very interesting thing. And, and what they bring in then uh, is they, they, they mine the substrate for things that they can live on. Now, here's something that looks like volutipes. This one is a harmless mushroom. Uh, Foliotor varus is the name. Uh, it's a little brown mushroom, an LBM. And it looks like volutipes. It's growing on wood. Um, this is growing on punky wood. The flamulitum volutipes grows on standing wood, which is hard. You could probably wrap your knuckles on it or hammer on it and it will ring. It's just hard wood. This wood here, you you know, just will absorb the blow of a hammer and thunk. It would just sink right in. This is spongy. So this is a this is a foliota, which is a wood-loving mushroom, which has brown spore prints. And it looks like, in this case, a bit like volutipes with a butterscotch cap. But, of course, it has a ring if you're looking at that. This one also is mistaken for uh, volutipes and also for honey mushrooms. This grows again on punky wood, fallen wood, and it looks like volutipes. It looks like honey mushroom, and this one is deadly. This has exactly the same chemicals that Amanita has, and I can tell you stories about the president of, an, of a mycological association and his wife out collecting mushrooms. They collected this one, the wife said, he said, they're honey mushrooms. The wife said, honey, you're mistaken. He said, no, they're not. Cook them up. And they both went to the hospital. And these are, this was the president of a mycological association. Anybody can make mistakes, right? So this is a, <laughs> you'll see a very, very interesting sport that you get involved with here. Now, when we come to milk mushrooms, there are a lot of milk mushrooms. There are probably 300 different species uh, commonly uh, in the area. Uh, I'm not going to talk about all of them, that's for sure. This one is uh, Lactarius. They're all called Lactarius of one sort or another but because they lactate, they give milk. And this one is called Hygrophoroides. Uh, it looks like, oides means in the face of, so it looks like Hygrophorus. Uh, Hygrophorus has, has wide kind of waxy gills. Another name for this mushroom is Lactarius distans for the distance that the gills have. You see they're very far apart and they're thick. Uh, so it has a number of names, but it's a nice butterscotch cap, the same color as the stem here, and the, the gills here are attached and they uh, it, it produces copious amounts of white sweet milk. Now, when you find this mushroom, it is wonderful. It grows under birch a lot. It's just a really wonderful mushroom. Here's a close-up of the gills and the milk there. You can touch your tongue to that, and it will taste sweet as can be. So generally, much those milk mushrooms that have a white sweet milk are good to eat. There are a couple of others. One of them, uh, one smells my favorite, is uh, Lactarius um, uh, volimus because of the volume of white milk it makes. It smells like fish, but as soon as you cook it, it, it is delicious. So it, it, I guess the uh, hygrophoroides uh, and, 
and uh, Valima. So it would be hard to know which one is better than that. Uh, Lauren, it looks like we are at the end of this sex segment. Yes, it does look like that. So uh, let me get you the second one. There we go. Okay. I won't be able to go back to the, the Hygrophorus, but here's another uh, one that's Hygrophoroides lookalike. It looks a bit like the other one. It's another Lactarius. This uh, goes by a number of different names, Vinicio rufescens. Uh, the, the whiny color of it, uh, and the, 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 the sometimes it's a, little, a bit zonate as this one is, but this one will give you yellow milk. And one of the things to bear in mind is that mushrooms that are uh, lactarius mushrooms that give you yellow or lavender milk that's a good indication of toxicity. This one is rather dry, it did not give as much uh, uh, latex as the, the, the previous one. Um, but but you want to avoid the ones of yellow or lavender milk. And there are lots of, I mean, there are lots of, of milk mushrooms, just a lot of them. Here's one which is commonly collected. It's called Lactarius deliciosus. It has orange or saffron milk, and then there it makes those blue-green stains. It's called delicious, deliciosus, but it's not nearly as delicious as the as some of the others that you'll get. Hygrophoroides is the best. This one is pretty good. There are some which have this 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 latex. It just gets thicker and thicker and thicker, uh, and some some people think that is poisonous. And some uh, I've eaten it and it's been fine. Uh, it's, but it, the, the, these mushrooms will get lots of different uh, associations attached to them. This is this is what we call a variable complex. Uh, when you look at uh, Smith, who who did taxonomy on these, I think he has about 25 different species in this complex of things that, that will have this orange milk, which will stain green. Okay, so there are a lot of them around and you'll want a very competent field guide when you're going out collecting them or go out with someone who's collected them for a long while. So this is the common uh, Agaricus campestris. There are a number of different names of this mushroom now. Uh, sometimes it's called Agaricus bisporus. Um, this one is uh, the mushroom of the field, uh, and it's the one of the, the 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 parents of the common white button mushroom you get in in supermarkets now. Um, some of the the original strain came from Paris, and the others came from the United States. But they both have these. Uh, it's it's uh, the ones that are bisporus. Each each. Um, the sidium here will have two rather than four um, sterigma sticking out of it. So you only have two spores rather than four, a common four spore. Uh, but A, a bisporus is not only the name of this mushroom, but it's A bisporus, but Amanita bisporus is the, the deadly poison Amanita. So <clears throat> not the thing about names. This is Agaricus campestris, the common mushroom of the field. It's commonly called a pink bottom mushroom. Uh, when it's young, these gills are white. Then they turn pink, and in maturation, they turn chocolate brown. And you see here uh, the thick flesh, which is quite good and somewhat almond smelling generally. Here is this, uh, this its cousin, which is very large. This is Arvensis, or the horse mushroom. And you see this is probably six or eight inches across. And this one has a much stronger, again, you see the pink here. The young ones are white, and then it goes through this pink stage into that dead did chocolate. Uh, and uh, commonly they grow in well manured fields where horses are. Um, and it has a very strong anise uh, component to the smell. Um, uh, uh, quite nice. Uh, there's a number of them in that sequence. Here, here's, here's one which is called Agaricus placomyces. This is a common mushroom in the area. It grows in the same places where the, where the field mushroom, um, Campestris and Arvensis grows, but this one is toxic. The difference is still has starts with white gills turning pink and chocolate. It has a more flattened top. <clears throat> and that one, <coughs> pardon me. <coughs> Just take a sip of water. That one is not, is, is toxic. 
there are hundreds of species in, in the genus Agaricus. Generally, those which will stain red with sodium hydroxide, say a Drano, mix some Drano with water and bring it around with you and put a drop on mushrooms that you'll get. It's one of the chemical tests you can do in the field. And those that stain red are generally good to eat. Those, those agaricus, and species in agaricus. And those with stained yellow are, stained yellow are generally toxic. However, Rick Kerrigan, the, uh, the, 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 the best agaricologist in, in the world, says that he is baffled by a lot of them that give both yellow and red stains at the same time. So you just need to know what mushroom you're picking. And again, have a good field guide. Check the mushroom in a number of guides. And even better than that, go out with someone who is collecting. Someone who's collected all their life and, uh, and, and see what and you'll, you'll, that's a good habit to get into. So here's another very good mushroom to eat. This is in the family you speak, Coprinus. It's been, the, the genus now has been segregated into a, a number of different genera, subgenera. But the, the older name for this, the stable name, is Coprinus comatus, growing on dung, growing on dung. And uh, this mushroom will grow on dung. Uh, this mushroom is so edible that it, it, what do we call this, it deliquesces. It actually digests itself. See that? It just digests itself. It's one of what's called the inky caps. So uh, you know this. It's called shaggy mane because the cap breaks up into these kind of shag, the shaggy uh, segment on the top. You can just peel those up and they'll keep peeling off. Uh, but look at this. This mushroom grows, has an annulus, and it grows from a bulb at the bottom. Right? So it's a... It's, it's an interesting mushroom. This is uh, quite edible. It's quite good to eat. Uh, it, it's hard to stop these mushrooms from turning uh, black here. But the way to do it, if, you, if you're fortunate to find a lot of them, is cut them off clean uh, and then put them in a jar of cold water in your refrigerator. And the, if oxygen can't get to them, it seems to preserve them and they'll last for perhaps a week. Otherwise, they'll last for maybe only a few hours. And, uh, but they are, they're delicious. A caution on this. There are some people who eat this mushroom day after day after day after day. It comes up in the fall and they will report a sort of ringing headache and uh, a, a kind of uh, um, almost a, a, a taste, an a, not, a, not an acrid taste, but a sharp taste in their mouths uh, because of uh, what apparently are toxins which accumulate from, from this mushroom. Now, here is another Caprinus. I think now this one's called Copernopsis, but it's Coprinus atramentarius. Uh, and this is sometimes called the tippler's bane. <laughs> if you drink, you don't want to eat this mushroom. This one is toxic if you have alcohol uh, after you eat the mushroom. Okay. Again, it, it has the same characteristics as uh, Coprinus comatus that we just talked about. We didn't talk about the hollow stem, but there's a hollow stem, you know, and it grows with that little ring at the bottom. Uh, it has uh, it deliquesces, has these spores that turn dark black, give you a black spore print. But this one, if you eat it, it's edible. You know, it, you can eat this mushroom. But if you have alcohol, maybe up to a week or two after it, you can get very sick. Now, how does that happen? When you drink alcohol, it decomposes in the body to a substance called acetaldehyde, which is toxic. Immediately, there's another enzyme which takes acetaldehyde and turns that into acetic acid and, and, and water and uh, carbon dioxide and, and, and so forth. So what this mushroom does is that it stops the metabolism of alcohol at the first stage. So as you have alcohol in your body, your, the, 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 your body will to decompose that and it creates acetaldehyde and this mushroom stops it. Some of you might know an alcoholic, um, maybe someone in your family or a friend, or maybe you yourself, who, uh, who've, had to, who've had trouble stopping drinking, and they have taken a drug called antabuse, spelled antabuse or antibuse, spelled both ways. Um, and that, 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 that's often used uh, for alcoholics. It, it's a slightly different chemical, but it works on the same process. So here's a mushroom that's safe to eat as long as you don't uh, drink alcohol. 
and the the reaction is almost instantaneous when you when you take alcohol with that. So here are two coprinus. Here's uh, Comatus, which is choice. Here's Atramentarius, toxic with alcohol. If you can tell the difference between those two, then go ahead and enjoy this one. Uh, uh, but again, in moderation, I would say. Uh, if you can't tell the difference, then, then don't have either of them. Now, this may be a surprise. Here's a mushroom of a completely different genus. This is a Clotosibi, and this one's called Clavipes, or big foot, big footed. This one is the same alcohol reaction. Okay? So it's a totally different mushroom, and yet somehow that, that mushroom has the same chemical uh, that will give the same reaction that Caprinus atramentarius does. So you would not want to eat this mushroom, which is edible, uh, if you plan on having any any drink with a meal or or for a few days afterwards. So uh, I don't I I've never uh, eaten this mushroom because I never know if I'm going to have alcohol. I don't drink, you know. But you know I could I could be invited to someone's house and they offer me prosecco or or a little wine or I might take I don't know a medication maybe that's got some alcohol in it. I just don't I don't want that for myself. So I just never use those. Here's a mushroom which uh, which illustrates a very interesting concept that some mushrooms are edible for some people and they're pretty toxic for other people. And this one is is fits right into that slot. This is Trichotillomopsis platyphyllum. Platyphyllum is broad uh, broad uh, uh, gills here, uh, and we'll look at we'll look at that. This is uh, it's also called Megacalibia rodmani. Uh, and there's a number of other names now. Um, um, Mega Calibia Rodmani, I think, is an, another name for it. Uh, but you see, it has this kind of streaked cap, this brown cap. Grows on wood. Uh, and if I take another picture, I'll show you something. You see how it has very little flesh. You just a lot of a lot of gills there, so just very little flesh in it. Um, if I just go back to this one. Oh, no, I don't have. I, I don't in this series. I don't have a. a picture of the slide, uh, slide of sliced mushroom, but the, gr the gills are very broad. There's hardly any flesh in the cap there. I've eaten that mushroom, and it you know, I, I had it cooked with butter and garlic, and it tasted just like anything cooked with butter and garlic. Uh, that's what it tasted like. Here's a, mushro a mushroom which is in almost every field guide, uh, this and its cousins. This is Foliota squarosa or squarosoides com a complex. There are a dozen different Foliota which bear these characteristics. Uh, they have scales on the cap with more with dry to to glutinous uh, matrix in between. They're going to have a brown spore print. They're going to grow on wood. Uh, this used to be considered edible, but because of the work with poison control, we know that so many people who have eaten this got sick that we know now to consider this not edible. And uh, it produces rather severe gastrointestinal distress. It doesn't mean that you couldn't eat it and you could survive. It would have no effect. Uh, but And that's fine if you want to eat it for yourself. But you would not take a mushroom like this and serve it to someone else. And you would certainly never do that if you had a restaurant. Uh, or you were, you were, you were cooking uh, as a chef uh, or a caterer. You would never do that. There are a lot of uh, there are a lot of uh, foliota in uh, the, the 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 common um, monograph has two must have about eight hundred eight hundred pages. It's two volume set, which we have at the at the Smiley Center. You can go and look at funny uh, foliota. You can look it up there. This is a uh, Cortinarius armillatus. Again, this is a mushroom which often appears as edible in field guides, but we know from work with poison control that this mushroom is poison. Okay? It, and it doesn't, doesn't mean that people haven't eaten this by the bushel in the past, but we now know that all cortinarius contain cortinin, which is that when and it causes uh, uh, toxic uh, reactions of, of greater or less degree. So this one was pretty easy to identify because of these bracelets around it. These are the spores from Cortinarius. There are about a thousand different species of Cortinarius in North America. And here's what. Only about 500 of them have ever been studied scientifically and have names attached to them. 
So that means in one way, every other court you pick up is 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 unknown. We just don't know what 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 name it is. We don't know what what it is. Uh, one of the reasons why why a lot of people now are collecting these mushrooms and they're doing uh, DNA analysis to try to get some uh, taxonomy of all these. But you don't want to eat any of these uh, quartz, and they're going to have uh, going to have rusty brown spore print and and gills. The, really, uh, the the gills here, uh, here you see it over here better. The, the gills in a quartinaria, a cortina means a curtain. So the the gills here are, um, and almost all of them, uh, are filamentous and, and like a spider web. And as the spores mature and fall on there, you'll get them here. And the resid so the residue hangs out down here as these bracelets on the uh, on the stem. And in this case, the gill is very evanescent, as they say; it just disappears. But these the evidence is right here on the ring. Now, here's a common edible mushroom. It's called the deer mushroom or the fawn mushroom. A Pluteus cervinus is a common name. Uh, Atricopilus is another name for the species. And, as, and again, a bunch of names for the mushrooms. Uh, this is edible, but I don't eat it. I don't think you'd eat it once. You probably wouldn't eat it again either because it's moldy. And the reason it's moldy is because of this. This is like Trichlomopsis platyphyllum we looked at three or four mushrooms ago. Look how broad the gills are. There's hardly any flesh to this mushroom. Mostly what you got are gills which produce spores. So when you eat the mushroom, you're getting all the spores and they give you that musty, moldy kind of scent. Nose, as they say in, in culinary arts, it has a musty nose. You know, sometimes you won't smell it going in, but, but on the exhalation, you'll get, you'll get those heated spores and you'll, you'll, you'll say, oh, what is this about? So this is the genera is called Pluteus. They're going to have pink gills. This is called pink, you know, um, and I'll show you another slide with pink spores deposit. And the gills are going to be free. This is a good mushroom to look at to know the difference between free and attached gills. You see here how the gills do not meet the stem? And right over here, see how they don't meet the stem? That's really a free gilled mushroom. When they do touch the stem, then they're attached. And they're attached uh, adnate or adnext or sinuate. A lot of ways they're attached, and 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 when you around you use field guides, you'll you'll get to know that terminology and how to do that. So, here's a pink spored mushroom which has attached gills. The gills you can see the spores actually uh, on on the gills themselves, and they're going out and they're they're touching the stem. So those are attached gills. Now this one from the top looks like a pluteus, and it has the pink gills. And you might think, well, it's a fawn mushroom, a deer mushroom. Let me eat it. But this is an Antiluma, broad, broadly speaking. The genus has been divided into a number of smaller genera. But in the, in the field guide approach, this is often called an Antiluma. Okay. And uh, you see the gills are, uh, are attached here. And they, you can see the pink spores there. And the other thing to notice is that here's a slug that was eating away at it. So you might mistake this as free gills. But that's evidence of, of a slug which has eaten this away. Okay, now you're going to say, well, okay, since something is eaten, it, it's got to be edible, right? Well, we don't know what happened to the things that ate it. They might be lying dead someplace. Their little paws pointed up towards hamster heaven or whatever. Or they, uh, they, they might be something like a slug, which has, does not have an uh, iron-based metabolism, a hemoglobin. They have a copper-based metabolism. <clears throat> so mushrooms, <coughs> pardon me, I'm coughing a lot. I have, <laughs> I have to tell you, I have broken ribs. The seat belt worked very well at a, at a recent uh, car encounter. And <laughs> I got two bro broken ribs and broken sternum, so I can't cough. <clears throat> that's why I'm sort of struggling with this thing here. I hope you can bear with that. So here, the slug, you know, when you look at this, how would you know whether it's, uh, it's you know, it, it's, you wouldn't know if it's edible or not just by, by this. But this is this mushroom has attached gills, and that's that's just a, a caveat here. Just be aware of something like that. So pink spored uh, mushrooms with attached gills are called entoloma, um, broadly speaking, and they should be considered toxic. There's one exception. We'll look at that in a minute. And to go back, uh, uh, 
pink gills, uh, free gills are pluteus mushrooms, uh, broadly speaking, and uh, they are generally edible. There's one which grows on wood, which is very rare. I've collected it only three times in three or four times in the 60 years I've been collecting mushrooms. Uh, and, but it looks just like an amanita, but it has pink gills. And it's growing on wood. Uh, but it's a very rare mushroom. But generally, they're, they're, they're edible. And that one, incidentally, is edible, too. Um, so here's an antelum abortivum. Okay. <clears throat> and then uh, what this mushroom does is that this antiloma will interact with another mushroom. You see here these little, this little mycelium threads coming in. It will interact with a honey mushroom, and it will make these lumpy forms. Now, <clears throat> this mushroom is called antiloma abortivum. But modern research seems to have it that because there are pink stains in here, and this has these are these rhizomorphs. This is a honey mushroom. Uh, this is really an aborted honey mushroom. In either case, it's a it's a symbiotic relationship between these two fungi, a honey mushroom which we don't see here, but the uh, you'll see the the uh, the uh, unaborted form like this, and you'll see these aborted forms all along it. They're they're lumpy and they're they're uh, they're mottled with pink inside. And they're sort of spongy, and some of them are kind of firm, and they're good to eat. Okay, note here the pink spore print. Before I go on, this cap of this mushroom is lying on this cap. The gills of this mushroom are on this cap. And you see how the, the spores have fallen there. Uh, in, in, in a bit, we'll talk about how you can make spore prints of your own. Uh, you don't have to rely on on this happening. These mushrooms are good to eat. And this is a whole basket of them collected. I don't know why all the, these slides are squished in a funny way. They're just doesn't have this, the normal perspective, uh, but they do. Uh, so the, these are these are quite good to eat. They have a, a rather robust uh, taste. So if you're cooking them, I would suggest cooking them in a very uh, robust sauce, maybe a burgundy sauce. I had a Hassenpfeffer dish once with uh, German uh, rabbit and. Uh, and dumplings, and these were put in with it, and oh my goodness, it was flavored with wine and mustard, and uh, oh, <laughs> gosh, my, I, my mouth's going to drool just thinking about it. It was a wonderful, wonderful meal. You can play with this mushroom if you can identify it, right? and that's the nice thing about these, these wild fungi. They all have their own distinct tastes and smells and textures. This is another really excellent mushroom. This is called Lepista nuda, or Clytosa binudum. Uh, this is called the bluet. This is choice. This mushroom is as good as you get. And notice how thick the flesh is, right? This mushroom will come up, in this case, it's growing out from needles, but it will come up from duff. Uh, up here, there are places where I collect this mushroom where uh, next to a cemetery is very good. Because when they rake all the leaves, they collect all the leaves and blow them into a big, big, big pile and throw grass and throw it on the side of the, the the cemetery and they put grass on top of it. That is the perfect medium for these guys. Uh, you can get and and the 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 compost pile will just be riddled with them, just be riddled, and you'll see the white mycelium that comes along with them. You can you can collect some of these mushrooms to to eat. And they're just this wonderful crisp mushroom with this nice lilac color. Um, they have a great smell, a little, little anise kind of smell to them. They cook very well. We'll talk about that in a minute. And, uh, but in, in the duff is going to be the white mycelium. So some of these are going to be old and over the hill. Just throw those in with the mycelium. Just, you know, just with your hand, reach down and grab some of this. Then bring it home and put it in your compost pile, which has leaves and grass. And uh, water it, and uh, if you're lucky, they're going to come up. And so these are great. These mushrooms, if you're going to cook them, you want to incorporate some, an anise-flavored liqueur, like um, the one I use is um, the French one that they make pastis with. That, uh, now I've gone blank on the name. Um, it'll come to me, but you you know what it is. You mix it with water, and it turns sort of milky. Uh uh, the, the 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 mountain men in France love that uh, that kind of anise 
flavor thing. But either, but you want to mix it either in the, burn it in when you're sauteing the mushrooms or mix it with the cream sauce at the end. And I'm sure the name will come to me before we finish this talk and I'll tell you at that point. Um, this is a great mushroom. You should, you should get to know this. It can be confused, however, all they all do with this one, you know, which looks a bit like the other one, doesn't it? This one, however, is mycorrhizal, which means that if it, it, it lives with it, with the symbiotic attachment with certain kinds of trees, like oak trees. And notice that the flesh on this is thin. The gills are rather large. Uh, it's, the stem is going to have a kind of uh, fuzzy, almost chevron pattern to it. Uh, one good good uh, way to tell it apart. And it's going to have a different spore print. Well, this one is a, a member of the hemoloba, hemoloma family. And this one is called Crestulina formi. Uh, it's, uh, it has that kind of the, the, that little kinolet sort of thing on the stem, which may be where that Crestulina comes from. Looks a lot like Lapista. Here's Lapista again. Here's Crestulina. So this, uh, this mushroom is called Poison Pie. <laughs> Good name for it. So here's the spore print. Now you make a spore print. And all your field guides will tell you to make a spore print, and they'll tell you about the spore color. So this is Lapista nuda. And what I've done here, this is a regular just uh, plate, that uh, dinner plate, and dessert plate or something. And I put a piece of white paper on it, and I put the name of the mushroom and when this one was collected. <clears throat> I cut the stem off the mushroom, and I put that mushroom on the piece of paper. I put a drop of water on the mushroom, and I covered it with a bowl. And I went away and I came back in a few hours and there's the spore print. If you think you have dark spore print, you can use half a white spore, white, white paper and half of it, a black paper. You can use it on, you can use it on aluminum foil. If you're going to collect a mushroom that you want to save the spores for, either to give someone else to cultivate or to, uh, to use it for your own study purposes. <clears throat> or if you find a mushroom you're sending to an herbarium, uh, I'll use, use aluminum foil there crimp them together. But uh, in this case here, this uh, Lapista has a pinkish buff spore print. Uh, it's, now this here, okay, this was taken from 98. That tells me I, I took that with with uh, Kodachrome 64 pushed to 100. That's what a film I was using at the time. And uh, it was pushed through a film processing program that doesn't exist anymore uh, and transferred to uh, a Windows program, a slide was then made and put on PowerPoint, and it's now going through a web jam process. So one the, one needs to be careful about those colors. If this were Hebaloma, though, it would be more more brown and more rusty. So uh, and again, these are subjective characteristics, and there's no bright line. You know, they're gonna they're gonna bleed together at some point. You know. All of nature is in a in a in a bell-shaped curve. Yeah. Every specimen you you pick is going to be somewhere on on a number of bell-shaped curves. So there's a lot of continuity in, in nature. It's not not hard-edged at all. Very fuzzy. So here is a chanterelle, Cantharellus siberius, the golden chanterelle. And again, uh, this is probably one of the ones you all know is very edible. Uh, very delicious, very good to eat, and uh, it's uh, it's one of the tops. Uh, it's mycorrhizal and uh, grows in, in, under certain trees and will come up uh, rather year after year. So it has what we call these decurrent gills. See, they're, they're really folds, not so much gills, but they run down the stem quite a bit. See how the, it's curled under here? But but these th these these decurrent folds or, or shallow gills. There's one species which is perfectly smooth, but it's just as good as, uh, um, as the Siberius. Uh, and those are, the, the, and they, they last a long time before insects degrade them, before they rot. They'll be out there for three or four weeks, uh, and they'll just get, generally get more and more dry, and insects will eat them. But, but they, 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 the in, insects don't, can't go through these very quickly. They have a peppery taste in German. They're, they're called Pfifferling for the pepper. And uh, cooked in butter, it couldn't be better. Boy, they're just wonderful. Uh, okay, here's a whole basket of them, you know. And uh, you can, when they're, when they're around, you can just collect, oh, 
gee, pounds and pounds of them, the pecks of them. They're, they're, they're wonderful. Um, here is Omphalotus illyrius or Clytosophy ludens. And I will tell you that uh, experienced mushroom collectors have collected this thinking it was Chanterelle. Uh, I was giving a, a, a class at uh, one of the, I think it was, might have been Ulster County Community College. And a guy walked in from a restaurant. He hadn't registered for the class. He just walked in. He had a whole basket of these. Uh, we had, 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 you know, maybe a, it wasn't a large basket, like a bushel basket. He just brought some in a, in a basket. You know, might, might have been, might have been half dozen of them, or maybe more. And he was, he wanted to advertise to the class. He said, "You mushroom people here, come to my restaurant tonight because we're. I found a bushel of these. We're cooking them up, and we're having the special of the week for you all." Well, they weren't. They were not chanterelles. You know, they were the jack o' lanterns. So fortunately for him and then his patrons, they, they, uh, he didn't he realized his error sooner rather than later. This is a Cantharellus cinnabarinus. It is a very small mushroom. It's maybe an inch, inch and a half, maybe up to three inches in, in across, thin fleshed, but they're all very good. This has a little peppery taste to it. Uh, and I have seen areas where this acres literally acres of this mushroom growing in, in moss. Uh, and moss is a good place for them to grow in because they're quite clean when you pick them. And they're, you cook them up and uh, uh, with butter and garlic or just butter and they're great. Now this is uh, the, uh, the false chanterelle. It's a uh, hygrophoropsis. Again, looks like hygrophorus. Or entiaca orange. Uh, it's a non-poisonous lookalike to chanterelles. One thing about this, see it has these kind of folds that are decurrent folds. And this mushroom is probably the first one to come up, one of the first ones to come up after drought. So after a drought in the, in the summertime, you'll find this mushroom coming up in the woods. Uh, uh, I've never eaten it. Uh, some people I know have. Uh, some people have reported toxic reactions from it, but I think most people uh, who have eaten it have found it to be edible. Um, so Hygrophoropsis orientiacum. Now, this has another look-alike to uh, chanterelles. It has, it has this kind of uh, uh, vase-like shape, just like a chanterelle does. It sort of curls over the top. It has some of that orange colorations. Uh, but this one uh, has uh, these little process, processes in the middle. This used to be in Chanterelle. It's called Cantharellus flaccosus. They now moved it to, years ago, they moved it to its own genera, a genus called Gomphus. So this is Gomphus flaccosus. And this is variable and pretty toxic. Uh, I can give you a number of stories about this. Uh, one of my favorite is uh, uh, a woman who was a card-carrying member of a mycological association. And she collected a bunch of these and she brought them to a local restaurant. The restaurant was a destination restaurant. People came to that restaurant from across the nation. And they were graduates of a top-notch culinary institute. And they were trained in all sorts of culinary techniques, yada, yada. She sold this to them as chanterelles. She may have actually identified them from a, a book that called them chanterelles. I don't know. They were preparing them. She gave me a call and she said, Bill, uh, I got a question. The chanterelles have that caca in the middle. What, is, what are they? What is that? I said, I'm not sure what you mean. And she described it. And then I shared a photograph with me. And I said, well, that's that's not chanterelle. That's gomphus flaccosis. It'll make, make some people, about a third of the people, eat it quite ill. She said, oh, my God. And she told me what happened. And so we called them and they were able to abort that serving as well. Uh, I can tell you a, do a dozen other stories about this mushroom. A lot of people eat this, and they have no no reaction whatsoever. They think it's good, and then they cook it up for their friends, and some of their friends get sick. And I can tell you one mycological association where the president and the, and, uh, the husband of the president cooked this mushroom up for the, the meeting, the mycological association meeting, 
And a third of the people who were there got sick. I didn't need it. But a third of the people, and I, I advised them not to eat it, but, it, but it smelled good. And the third of the people who ate that got sick, and they never again came back to that mycological association. And I don't blame them one bit. So, this is gumpus flacosis. Uh, just watch out for it. Now, this is another one of those chanerelles, the black chanerelle. This is Craterellus cornucopioides. It used to be a cantharellus, but no, Craterellus cornucopioides or Craterellus phallax, a couple other different names. You might call this the horn of plenty or the trumpet of death or black trumpets. These are edible and so good. You, you can see that they're black and they, they live in, among the leaves just like a, you know, it's hard to see. You'll smell this mushroom before you, uh, before you see it generally. And again, you can pick pounds of this mushroom when you, when you find it and when you see it, you pounds of it. And uh, they are one of the best. Uh, I recently had some of them that I found. Um, up, I'm up here in Maine. I found some last week uh, and brought them home and uh, fried them up with, uh, sauteed them with shallots and uh, maybe there's a little garlic and some butter and mix that with some rice, some basmati rice. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. That just, oh, go to town on that. Yeah. This is a, something that might be mistaken for a chanterelle. Uh, this is a, but this is a mushroom growing on a mushroom. This is hypomyces, myces, mushroom, hypo. A mushroom growing on lactifluorum, uh, a, a milk mushroom. Okay, so this mushroom will grow on uh, Lactarius and Mushal species. And if it's a non-toxic species it's growing on, this mushroom is edible. And this mushroom has a lobster kind of smell to it. It The 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 uh, Hypomyces turns the, uh, the, the, the Rushla or the Lactarius into this very crisp mushroom. It, it's very crisp. It's uh, uh, and very delicious. It has that lobster smell, so it's called a lobster mushroom. And I have been at forays in Maine where 300 people uh, ate this mushroom and lobsters, and everyone said it was a meal that couldn't be beat, and not a single person got sick from it. Because the, when we collected that, we collected it only when we could were sure that it was collected from non-toxic mushrooms. One of the things about this mushrooms is that it often will start growing underground, and it's very difficult to get the dirt off of it. So the ones you want to collect are ones that are nice and clean. I have some growing in my yard right, right here right now that are just covered with dirt. And I just, I'm not going to pick them because there's just nothing left there. They are, this will have a white stage, a golden stage, and then a red stage to it as it goes, as it goes through its, its uh, asexual series and sexual series. Now, this is another hypomyces, hypomyces hyalinus. It's growing on Amanita rubescens and other Amanita species. So this is the Amanita uh, mold. Uh, and you can see here, it's, this mushroom here is uninf uninfected. This mushroom is infected, and this mushroom here is becoming infected. So uh, I, 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 had, I arranged this slide, if I memory serves me correct. I moved them so to get this. But, uh, but a number of people who have, uh, mycologists who have seen this said it's, it's one of the best illustrations of that they've seen because you see all stages of it right there. Now, I want to call your attention to something. This has to do about critical thinking and, and using the Internet. There's a very popular Internet chef. And, I, and when I look at his YouTubes, he gets thousands of hits. And one of the things he says is that the white lobster is edible. He probably means the white stage of Hypomyces lactifluorum that we saw in the last slide this one, that the white stage of that is edible. But if you didn't know that, and you read his blog, and he said, oh, the white lobster is edible, and you found this, you could be committing a pretty serious mistake. So one wants to be aware of those things uh, uh, always. And Lauren, it looks like, again, we've come to the end of that section, and it looks like we have uh, maybe 15 minutes to do the next section. It is true. We are short on time. I do want to make sure that we have enough time for um, 
for our uh, chat questions. Okay. So I might just throw a few questions out here right now. Okay. Um, so kind of going back to almost way back to the beginning about the destroying angel. Yeah. I'm wondering how, um, when does the first symptoms of illness show up after you eat a destroying angel? That's a very good question. Uh, it's generally uh, eight to 12 hours uh, when it shows up and it will show up as a bloody stool. It'll show up an upset stomach uh, and, and a bloody stool, uh, maybe vomiting. Uh, and, um, uh, uh, upset stomach. Uh, at that stage, if you go to the hospital or see a doctor, they might give you Tums or something if you don't know what it is. But if you bring the mushroom and say you've eaten a mushroom, then they'll know what to do. Uh, one of the things they'll do at that stage is they'll take liver enzymes and check your, your bilirubin and other liver, liver enzymes. And, and if they are fit a certain category, they'll begin treating you. One of the ways to treat this early is to use a charcoal slurry. If it's very early, you just drink a, a, a quart of, of charcoal and, and water, activated charcoal and water, and the charcoal will absorb that. And then you then you try to make people puke it up and pass it out the back. You give them all sorts of stuff to make them get it out of the body. Uh, it, the symptoms will go away on their own. The second day is, uh, is remission of symptoms. The symptoms come back the third day because now the the kidney and liver has been destroyed. So that there, there are different treatment options available at that point. Mm -hmm. But that was yeah. a very good question, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that is that is a good question. Um, and I know that we talked a little bit about this also way, way back in the beginning um, about how you don't know how a person will react based on how an animal will react to yes, um, right. to mushrooms. So one of the questions is how much of a problem is mushroom toxicity for dogs? Oh, as a dog yes, owner, right. I would yeah. like to know that as yeah, well. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's in, in, in poison control. Those are the calls we're getting now. And they're getting them because ethically we don't, they're not sending us cases with people because mm -hmm. we're talking with patients and, and patients privacy is being uh, maintained there. But dogs are a different story. It didn't matter if you talk about the dogs. So we get a lot of that and they eat mushrooms that, you know, people eat and, and don't have any problems to. The two common mushrooms that I seem to get a lot with dogs are um, honey mushrooms and, um, I'm using so many Latin words, I can't find the one I'm looking for here. Uh, a, a little one that's a very fibrous cap uh, that uh, grows uh, uh, saprophytic on, on dead soil. Gosh, I can't. Oh, gosh, the name's just rolling around my head now. I, 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 I may think of it before the, the talk is over, but uh, the problem with too many uh, Latin names is they just poison the brain. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> but those are, the, those are the ones I get. And uh, uh, you, you, you wouldn't want to, uh, yeah. And, 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 I, and often, uh, one of the things about dogs, this is interesting, a dog will eat a mushroom and go throw it up and another dog will eat the vomit. You know, I mean, dogs eat all kinds of stuff. Uh, <laughs> the other thing we find about, about mushroom poisoning in dogs is that sometimes the people think that the dogs have been poisoned by mushrooms, but the dog is a barker and the neighbors give them rat poison. Oh, isn't that fun? Hmm. We're, we're, we're such we're such a a, a nice a, a pleasant species to live among. <laughs> yeah, but so, generally, yeah. So there you go. It's, so the honey is the honey mushroom a problem for dogs? Does that make them yeah, yeah, fun for us to eat? It appears to be a, a problem for dogs, yeah, but they, okay. they, they're eating it raw. They're not cooking it. Uh, out west, they eat a lot of amanita. I, I don't, I've had one or two dogs eat an amanita. Yeah, dog that was brought to Tufts University to study. It was uh, one of those huge uh, 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 Ber uh, Bernice Mountain dog. It was a thousand dollar dog, you know, that just uh, uh, ate a mushroom in the yard. And, and gosh, every amanita expert in the world was brought in on that one. And Rod Tullis thought that he had identified a toxin on a new on a mushroom that we didn't know was there before. It, yeah, they they're 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 out there in the front lines telling us what to eat, what not to eat. I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But they like so, you know they they like things that are moldy and and, dec and decaying. Yes, they do. <laughs> they do. I, <laughs> they're dogs. Yeah, they're dogs. Yeah, they're, I guess you know just just be a uh, very uh, on top of what your dog is doing. You know, keep keep an eye on your dog, just like. 
around the kitchen and any other time because yeah. they'll, they'll eat all yeah. kinds of stuff. So uh, let, um, me, let, me, let me mention a book by uh, I think it's John Young, J O N G. Uh, it might be called The Immense Universe. It's all about the senses of different animals. And we think that animals are, their, sense, their senses are a lot like ours. Mm -hmm. They are very, very different. It's amazing. And dogs, as you, as you, any dog owner knows, is primarily uh, their sense of smell. Mm -hmm. And uh, so they love that. They love smelly stuff. They do. They love the stinky stuff, don't they? Yeah. 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 Well, getting back a little bit to uh, um, our weather that we had this summer and the drought, um, one of the questions is about drought affecting the timing of chanterelles emerging. How does that impact it? Well, I'm, I'm sure it's going to delay it. Uh, whether if, if you have rains, some rain, it doesn't have to be a lot of rains during the summer, enough to keep the mycelium alive and nourishing it so that it, it, it gets lower. It, this mycelium will stay alive because they're, they're, uh, they're attached to trees, so they'll, they'll stay alive. Uh, but you want it to nourish, so it's got to have a lot of, of uh, mycelium there to support some mushrooms. If it's too dry, that, that mycelium never happens, and, and those mushrooms will not appear the whole year. There are mm -hmm. places here where I, where chanterelles should have appeared this year. Every year in the past they have, and there were none there. Mm -hmm. uh, um, and and some places down in 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 the Hudson Valley when I went down to look around there, where I couldn't I could not find a single mushroom. So they delay it in that way. Uh, time will tell if uh, if they're going to come up later. Mm -hmm. uh, John Haynes and I went out to uh, Erie Erie County one year looking for. Uh, hypomyces, uh, little truffles that were growing in the ground. And we stumbled upon, uh, this was in November, I think, and we stumbled upon uh, chanterelles that just were unbelievable. They just were, we had to kick them aside to to, to dig for the, the truffles. It was remarkable. Wow. Yeah, and just for everyone's reference, what is the typical time of year that you would go out looking for chanterelles? Oh, they can start in June. They're a okay. typical summer mushroom. They can start in late June, uh, June, July, August, September, October. They they can come a long a, a long time. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it wouldn't surprise me that uh, it's getting a little cool now up here uh, after frost and night. You wouldn't find them, but but if you got if you have warm days, they could they could still come up now. In the Hudson Valley, they could still come up. Yeah. 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 That's, that's why I thought there were more like, yeah, summertime ones, but um, yeah. And I know that um, in, I almost said next month, but that's October. We're still in September. I'm jumping ahead. Just like, just like you kind of were, we're not, we're not jumping into the future here, but um, in November, um, your next uh, presentation in this series will be about the mushrooms that come up um, and later in the fall that we'll still see out in the woods um, yes. after the frost. Yeah. After um, the frost. Yeah. Yep, yep, after the frost, so um, in early November, we'll have another one of these presentations, and we also have a walk scheduled with that one where um, we can actually get out into the field. It's wonderful, that these pictures, as you said, this one that's up on the screen right now is a, a fantastic representation of, of what things to look for, for edibles and non-edibles, but it's another thing to like get out there and see it um, in real life, you know, and uh, get it in your hands. Um, and, and really see where it's growing. Um, so, yeah. So I'm hoping that, you know, we're going to have some good uh, mushroom weather coming up. Um, so far, um, as I was saying earlier, um, planning out this presentation and we were going to have a walk with it, but we're like, I don't know if it's going to rain. And we have had some rain. So I'm sure our audience has probably even noticed um, that a few mushrooms have been popping up around their yard alongside trails and in the woods. Um, so I'm hoping that some of our wet weather is going to continue so we can get some nice uh, mushrooms out there. It's been it's been nice to see them coming up again this season mm -hmm. after such a dry summer. Oh, yes. Oh, friends come up. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it was, it was, uh, it was rough seeing, uh, not seeing any mushrooms and having it be so dry, or or other uh, creatures that are out there. You're looking for them, and everything is just hiding away because it was so dry. Mm -hmm. So, do, do we? Do you want to go on with the next section? I can go through the. Well, I think we more. only have a, about five more minutes of our yeah. time left, so okay. I kind of want to be respectful of your time and everyone Good. else's time. Sure, um, yeah. If anyone else has any um, questions, we are happy to answer them in the time that we have left. 
Um, so feel free to, um, to pop a question in the chat or the Q&A section. Um, if you'd like to raise your hand to speak, we can, um, we can get you on here. Um, but this is again, a wonder, another wonderful presentation um, and a lot of information, so much information that we don't have time here <laughs> for all of it. Do you, um, do you have any recommendations? I know in our um, handouts that we have um, for folks that there are some recommendations of books to use, some field guides and books to use. Um, but for those of our uh, audience that are maybe watching this as a replay and they don't have these handouts, is there um, any oh, sure. book that you would definitely say, this is the one you should have? It's great for beginners. It's great for out in the field. Yes, uh, I, I think hands down the... Uh, the most popular field guide in, in North America is the Audubon Field Guide to North American Mushrooms. Uh, Gary Linkoff uh, is the author of that. It's, uh, it's I don't know, it's maybe 30, 30 or so different printings. It's just a perennial favorite. Mm -hmm. uh, they're all, and those are the names I've used in this talk. Um, some of the some of the understandings of the of the edibility of those mushrooms have changed over the years. A lot of the names have changed, but some of them change back. So uh, and and that book is called the is, there's there's more photographs, more species per dollar than any other book you're going to get. Mm -hmm. It's a true field guide. It can fit right in your pocket. It's printed on very special paper, which is thin and strong, and uh, there's a lot of text there. They're very good descriptions. Um, and the photographs are color corrected. Uh, they're all quite, quite nice there. Something happened to my screen, a whiteboard. It was me. Oh. <laughs> So um, I was just testing something out. Um, okay. one, of, one of the questions is um, talking about the slide that's up on the screen right now. If you could yeah. go over that again. Um, I was playing with the whiteboard mostly because um, your pointer, when you point to something with your cursor, our audience cannot see that. So, no kidding. Oh, whoa. <laughs> yeah. So there's a little um, pencil at the top there. It says turn whiteboard on. And um, yeah, you should be able to, with that pencil, maybe now. Um, are, you, are you seeing now? Are you seeing now? Let's see. Do you have a little pencil on there? There's no pencil. There's still my cursor. Uh, uh, oh, uh, yeah. Okay, there we go. I just drew. <laughs> I just drew on oh, there. Oh, you did. Okay, I can't. I did. Uh, I might I, make this white okay yeah, I, cannot, I cannot draw with mine oh okay well i can so you are referring to the mushroom that is all the way to the right so this one whoops helps if i turn that on so this one i i don't see it on, i don't see your cursor on my screen did you see that i circled oh i see you circled it yes you have right, right. all right <laughs> Yeah, so the one that's all the way to the right in that slide. Can you talk about that one? Oh, that's an amanita. It's uh, it's uh, rubescent. Uh, it uh, turns red, and it uh, it's uh, it. Some people will eat that. Uh, there, there. It depending on how to say this. It superficially looks like uh, other amanitas, which are not edible. And the, the colors there depend upon the particular enzymes in the mushroom itself, that, that, that process. But that, that is typical for a mushroom that would, might be called a, a blusher, one name for it. And then Anita rubescence is another name for it. And uh, that one is, uh, that's the Amanita. The one on the left is the, all the way on the left where it's white. That's a mushroom, the same mushroom, which is now covered with a mold. And this is the this is the amanita mold, uh, rather than than the Hypomyces lactiflorum. So uh, again, it's a, it's another mushroom, another fungus, fungus which is turning the amanita on the right uh, into a moldy, phallus shaped amanita. And sometimes you'll find the whole forest covered with these phallic shaped white phallic shaped mushrooms. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, so that's I, a fungus growing on a fungus. A and, fungus and growing on a fungus, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I use that mushroom just to, among other things, to point out the uh, the, the problem with, with uh, just not understanding, not communicating clearly what, what you mean when he says white lobster is edible. 
Uh, I, I don't know what he means by that, but uh, certainly this mushroom is not edible. Right. Yeah, the one yeah. that's circled right now, not edible. That's right. It's a white, you might think of it as a white lobster, but it's it's not edible. Yep. Right. And then this one here, you would want to eat. I would not eat it. No. Oh, no, you won't eat it. Okay. No. Some amanitas. people, some people do eat the amanitas. Yeah. Sure. You don't know. You don't know though. In, in this case, the mold is growing on on amanita russula, which could be which some people eat. Mm -hmm. It could be growing on another amanita, which is poison. Mm. And then if you just so if you're just going to eat the white lobster part of that, the white one, you don't know what's under it. In the same way that if I just should I go to the previous slide? Sure. See what I got here. Yeah, on this one here, uh, do I have one? No, I don't have that one. So I, this one here, this the mold has covered the entire. Uh, we don't know what, what the, whether it's a rushula or a lactaria. It's covered the entire mushroom, just on this one here. So you can't. You, you'd have to get in and try to find some spores and other things to identify the species it's growing on. But this this will have a white mold in the beginning. You can't see my cursor, so, right. so th this will the, this mushroom will first be be look like a regular uh, rushula or lactarius, and then a mold will grow on it. And it'll be white, and then that mold will turn yellow, and then it will turn scarlet, and there'll be little par what are called parathesia, little tiny pimples in amongst that. Where the the uh, and on this one, I can see the I can see the pimples on the, um, let's say, the, the gills that are pointing straight up towards the word lactiflorum. So like uh, these? Yes, right, I see it, right, mm -hmm. like those. Mm -hmm. those but the, the, the time, if I could do that with my with my thing, I could, let me see this here, turn. No, it's not, it's not working on my machine. Um, but but the, but they're, 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 those right pimples there are the perfect stage of the uh, uh, of the imperfect uh, mold, and it, and this is that's where the tiny um, the tiny perfect stage a tiny mushroom would be inside those little parathesia. Hmm. Yeah. So. Well, that's okay. That's great. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for thanks for uh, clearing that up because that that is uh, like you said the. Um, the slide, this slide right here is a great representation of the different stages that can happen and the confusion that can be caused um, by these different forms, these different stages. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Yeah, well, we are officially out of time. <laughs> but thank you once again, Bill, for another great presentation. Um, and yeah, this has been recorded. So um, this will be up on our website soon. For all of our participants, I will send out a link to it once it is up there. We do have a YouTube channel, um, and there's lots of great videos, not just of our um, virtual programming that we have, but also some information about uh, Mohonk Preserve in general, our different departments and what we do here. So we do have lots of videos. Um, and then on our website, there is also a section for our virtual programming recording. So there's a great archive with lots of other presentations by Bill and other presentations from other presenters. So please do check that out and uh, look for in early November, we will be doing another one in these series um, and including a walk with that as well to get us out into the field. So I hope yeah. everyone can join us for that. Yes, right. Thank you all very much. Right. Thank you. Yes. So Thanks thank you, all. Bill. And thank you all for joining us. Okie doke, right. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.